Hi, so with apologies for the video quality, unfortunately, I'm on my laptop right now. I'm trying to get a better camera. This lecture will talk uh, about the rest of Bolivar, which we haven't talked about yet. And then we'll also move into talking about Toussaint Louverture, who's uh, our other figure for this week, who was one of the major authors of the Haitian constitution. So uh, let's dive in. We also need to talk about Bolivar's philosophical ideas now. So we've already brought up the question of what is this new national identity that's forming as a result of the struggle for independence? Um, what's informing it? But there's other kind of political issues at stake as Bolivar is writing both the Jamaica letter and then later on when he addresses the Congress at Angostura. And these questions are questions of what is the correct form of government for these new nations? Where are these ideas coming from? What is spurring his analysis? And importantly, is he wrong maybe about his predictions for what's democratically, uh, politically possible for uh, South America? One feature of his address is this analysis of federalism. Bolivar is very interested in different forms of government, and he doesn't think that they're all created equal. Bolivar thinks federalism is the most perfect form of government, just kind of like this is one of the most perfect forms of kitty. Hi, kitty. She'll be popping in and out sometimes because she's not happy being locked out of the room. So federalism is a system, as you might know, from the U.S., which is the, U the U.S.'s system that grants power to states that can sometimes be separate from the power of the federal government, right? So the total, total nation doesn't necessarily uh, dominate over the individual components of the nation. That's, that's sort of one version of federalism. Um, Bolivar thinks that the correct form of government for the republic he's trying to form is a centrist government, one with a lot of centralized power. Now, why does he think that? He's gonna make a lot of claims, both in the Jamaica letter and in the Agostura address about the character of the Venezuelan people as he understands them. And this will also then tangentially be related to his assessment of the character of, you know, Colombians and Ecuadorians and, and Panamanians. Um, is that how you say it, Panamanians? <laughs> I'll have to look that up later. So. He doesn't think that the character of these people is well suited to a federalist government. That's kind of an insulting thing to think, right? So where is it coming from? Um, well, a couple different routes. One thing is that uh, there's this political theorist, this French political theorist named Montesquieu, who wrote, and you know, before even the the conquest of the Americas, uh, about different forms of government. And Montesquieu believed that a government needed to be suited to the character of the people that it was governing. So he didn't think that all forms of government were the same for everybody. Bolivar stretches this idea a little bit and he moralizes it in a way. He thinks that federalism requires virtuous citizens. It requires the most virtuous citizens because in order for there to be a good distribution of power between the states and the central government like there is under federalism, you need to make sure that kind of everybody's interested in doing their job and uh, in cooperating, even though they have power to not cooperate. Um, so he's afraid of things like gridlock and the inability to make decisions, right? Um, the first couple of republics that he tried to form in Venezuela, in his opinion, showed him that, that federalism was not workable and that you needed a strong central power, someone who basically got to tell everybody in the provinces, all right, this is what you have to do um, because it would help organize everybody, particularly in a time where this nation is threatened by outside forces. Maybe you need to be able to make quick moves, uh, you know, crush rebellions uh, against your newly formed government, maybe things like this. Um, and federalism just made it too easy for everybody to form their own independent faction and not work together, in his opinion. At the same time, though, some of his thoughts about the best form of government come from what he thinks the character of the people is. <laughs> he thinks that the character of the people of the Spanish Americas 
is the character of slaves. So he's used the word slaves here, not just to mean, as we would say now, people who are subjugated um, without pay, right? In something like an encomienda system. He's talking about um, slavery to Spain. And the metaphor is in some ways stretched, um, but let's see how, what we can say on Bolivar's behalf to make sense of it. So it is the case that all of these Spanish American nations were subjugated to Spain in often unfair ways, right? The, the peninsulares, the Spanish born citizens had a lot more rights than the non-Spanish born citizens of this vast empire. Um, Spain had decided what these different nations could produce in terms of goods and what they couldn't produce in terms of goods, what they were and were not allowed to make money off of. Um, they mostly directed profits to the Spanish crown. Um, they didn't, for the most part, allow non peninsulares so non-Spanish born um, citizens, as many political rights or opportunities for government. Um, and also, Spain told these different nations that they couldn't talk to each other. So being, being a native-born person of the Spanish Americas really was like being a second-class citizen, and you really were subject to much stricter rules than Spaniards were. Um, and in this sense, Bolivar thinks that for a couple of centuries now, Spanish Americans have just been like slaves to Spain. They, they are subject to a tyranny, they don't have a representative government, they don't have the ability to locally decide their own affairs, um, all this stuff. So Bolivar thinks that over time this has molded the people of the Spanish Americas into people with very vicious, in his opinion, characters, by which we don't necessarily mean like evil, but we mean um, they've, they've formed bad habits, the habits in his view of um, subservience and maybe bad temperament. Um, he thinks that people don't know what to do with their freedom once they have it. I don't know if that makes sense or not, right? Like, what does it mean to say, like, you don't know what to do with freedom? This is a question I have. Why does he think that having been subjugated makes it difficult for you to know what to do when you're not subjugated? This is an important philosophical question. Um, and I do think that we can meditate on it. There's elements here that might ring true like if you read accounts of people, if you know anybody who's left prison after a long time serving time, um, their experience of the world is vastly different from the experience of someone who's never been in prison before, right? After, after a period of long confinement, there's, there's a certain sort of almost bewildering feeling when you move out into the world. Um, we can ask, is this what Bolivar is referring to? Is that a difference in character? Um, and secondarily, is this the kind of thing, if this is an explanation, I'm not sure whether it is the explanation, is this the kind of thing that would make a particular form of government difficult for you? Are there certain things that someone who has experienced slavery or experienced imprisonment not able to follow the laws that are formed by this new government? Altogether, this is not a very flattering picture that Bolivar has of Spanish Americans. And Bolivar thinks that North America has a really good system of government, but he thinks it's not viable for, for South America. And again, it's because he thinks people in the US are more virtuous than people in South America. It might be like, come on, dude, like what kind of nationalism, what kind of patriot are you? The conclusion of this line of thinking then is that Bolivar thinks the best type of government for the South Americans is a centrist government, not a monarchy, because he thinks that a monarchy isn't very stable. He thinks monarchs have a tendency to want to conquer more territory and that this tends to go very badly for them. Whereas he says, look, if you're in a liberal democracy and you have a liberal constitution, you're not necessarily going to want to go and spread 
your liberal constitution to other places. And I'm going to look at you and ask, is that true? <laughs> right? Is it true that if you're in a liberal democracy, you don't want to spread your liberal democracy all over the place? Is this a good or a bad prediction of what he was? Who knows? But the point is, he thinks that a centralist, uh, a centrist republic, a liberal democracy that's strong in its central power is the best form of government. And he rejects a federalist system for South America. There's a funny consequence to this um, in that he asserts, at least in the Angostura address, that he doesn't think it's a good idea for one citizen to hold a lot of power or for like particular citizens to hold a lot of power for an extended period of time. So he says, quote, the continuance of authority in the same individual has frequently meant the end of democratic governments. Repeated elections are essential in popular systems of government for nothing is more perilous than to permit one citizen to retain power for an extended period. This seems a little bit ironic given that he ends up being sort of, he ends up making attempts to make himself be president for life. Um, and in this letter and in, in, in the Angostura address, he sounds kind of humble. He sounds like he doesn't know his own position of power, like he's leaving it up to the assembly to decide. But in practice, he does have a lot of political power. He does have some influence on how things go. So how honest is he being here, we might ask. Does he already foresee an issue um, with what he's saying, or does he believe it this time around? Another thing that's kind of anti-democratic of him in a way is that he, he talks about the system of government in Britain. And one of the things that Britain has at this time is it has these uh, parliamentarians who are elected for life terms and who can inherit their peerage, right? So their sons can get access to the parliament. Um, and instead of thinking that this is a bad system for a democratic government, Bolivar praises it. He thinks that this is pretty cool because it keeps the king in check. In some ways, Bolivar is motivated mostly by practical considerations. He wants to know, how can we get a country up and running? And uh, insofar as he's interested in that question, he's not necessarily making philosophical commitments that are in the same vein as someone who's, you know, like Montesquieu, sitting and writing out political theory, right? Bolivar is, is in the mess of things. He's in the middle of stuff. And he wants to figure out, all right, what's the way that I can form a republic? At the same time, we need to be able to ask about what these authoritarian tendencies, if you can call them that, what, what these uh, centralist, dictatorial situations that end up cropping up for his project, what they mean in his thought. Is, is he making mistakes? Is he overlooking things that he should know better about? Um, and in part to help us answer this question, and also to address more directly the issue of civil rights in the Americas, um, I want to now turn to talk about Haiti and the situation in Haiti and the kind of political thought, the historical background that's going on there and the enormous influence that Haiti's political situation had on other people in the Americas. All right, so Haiti, what is there to say about Haiti? Um, well, first of all, being a slave sucked, right? And Haiti wasn't the only place in South America or the Caribbean with intense slavery and many people brought over from the African continent to serve European settler colonial interests, right? But Haiti was the first successful slave revolution in history. So Spartacus in the Roman Empire had tried to liberate himself and uh, his fellow kind of gladiator slave folks, but he didn't succeed. So Haiti really was a historically monumental event, uh, the Haitian Revolution. Now, by all accounts, the conditions in Haiti were pretty bad 
even by badness of slavery standards. And I won't go over them because it's pretty gruesome, but there were still many groups of people on the island um, and not all people of color on the island were enslaved. So there was in fact an, a hierarchy among people of color because there were free people of color um, who had higher status. Uh, some of them were relatives of white Creoles uh, or, or even white peninsulares um, and so had kind of a, a slightly better status in society. And then there were also hierarchies among um, enslaved people because um, newly arrived slaves were often treated very poorly by the slaves that were currently in Haiti. And um, when, as sometimes happened, slaves were freed, often free, newly free people of color would very badly mistreat current slaves. So it was a mess. Haiti was a mess. The white people all hated each other. The black people all hated each other. Mixed race people hated everybody else. It was it was a tough place to be. And as a result, it shouldn't be surprising that these were the conditions that spurred a revolution. So there had for a time been lots of kind of scuffles, fights, raids by different groups of people. Um, on the white plantations. Everybody pretty much lived in fear on Haiti, and it took them a while to get organized, but eventually uh, at least one figure, multiple figures, showed up that um, vied for uh, the elimination of the institution of slavery. So in 1789, the National Assembly in France publishes the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This has an explosive effect in Haiti. Um, on the one hand, the rich white plantation owners see this as a reason for them to seek independence from France, right? So they, they want the power to themselves. They don't want this overseas rule. Something that we also saw was an initial cause for independence um, among white Creoles in South America. Um, but at the same time, this declaration is a little ambiguous. It's not clear whether or not it means to include or exclude women or, say, slaves or people of color. So there were actually free people of color that traveled to France to try to secure their ability to vote in this new assembly, and they got violently put down. And um, at the same same time, the slaves see this as kind of a double bind. On the one hand, it can give them an opportunity, a claim for their own equality, but at the same time, they don't want their white Creole masters to gain independence from France because this will mean probably they'll be further brutalized. So at first, the slaves ally themselves with the British against against this new insurrection. And then they switch sides. There's a lot of side switching. I can't go into the details of the history because it's actually quite confusing. But the, the result is that you get um, certain thinkers, and our focus for today is Toussaint Louvertreau, um, whose name I can't pronounce very well, I apologize. But um, Toussaint Louvertreau, uh, was a freed slave himself who was attempting to adopt ideas of the Enlightenment while at the same time keeping in mind that they are that they don't need to be made to be exclusively the province of educated men, of learned people, that they're not elitist in some way. He thinks that he can make these ideals operate and respect the state of the public and the people um, of even the lowest classes. And his deepest interest is to abolish slavery. This is his life cause. So he ends up switching sides a few times in the, the revolution and the slave revolt. Um, he serves as a general at different times for France and then Spain and then back to France. And he forms kind of an autonomous government that's still sort of loyal to, to interests abroad, 
But his ultimate goal, what makes him switch sides, is that he cares about being on whatever side will get rid of slavery. And it is under these conditions, after a successful first few fights for independence, that Louverture and the other Haitian uh, revolutionists write the first Haitian constitution. So perhaps the most important element of this first Haitian constitution of 1801 is uh, Article 3, followed quickly by Article 4 and Article 5. So here's Article 3. There cannot exist slaves on this territory. Servitude is therein forever abolished. All men are born, live, and die free and French. Article 4 states, All men, regardless of color, are eligible for all employment. And Article 5 says, There shall exist no distinction other than those based on virtue and talent and other superiority afforded by law in the exercise of a public function. The law is the same for all, whether in punishment or in protection. Now, it's always really interesting to read the first constitutions of newly formed states, newly formed nations around the world, because in a way they express the desires of the people assembled, um, the ideals of the people assembled to, to try to become these things. The Constitution is in a way a form of expression of hope, right? Because Constitutions set down laws that then hopefully will be followed. Unfortunately, in the case of Haiti, it had a succession of different um, attempts at nation building that failed for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the ultimate reason for the instability of Haiti ended up being just that it honestly was economically devastated by the wars of independence. But you can see here in this first Haitian constitution the ideals espoused by a lot of these revolutionaries, these abolitionists, to above all enshrine in the constitution the idea that all people are born free and equal and that all people are allowed to seek employment, and that all people really are, are equal except for whatever merit um, they have earned or whatever t talent they, they happen to have. And this is really quite important because it's the first time, maybe, that the notion of equality gets tested as an idea that transcends race. Uh, right? So the United States has already found independence by now, but even there, slavery is still an institution. Um, and we'll see in the Americas as well, um, this, I guess, uh, equality experiment is a little haphazard. Not everybody adopts it in the same way. Not everywhere is it enshrined in the laws. And even in Haiti, it doesn't work out immediately. At one point, um, people get enslaved again, there's, you know, there's invasions and things like this. Um, they go through a lot. But this is the first time that, especially the French, realize, oh man, is this the real implication of this declaration of the rights of man? Is this really what it means? And it sort of freaks out the whole rest of the world, this event in, in Haiti. At least the whole rest of the white world gets freaked out by this um, it's very much something that affected the slaveholding south of the United States. It caused them to be more cautious and more protectionist. And ultimately, that's one of the things maybe that led to such a long delay in the abolition of slavery. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that after this uh, abortive attempt at creating a nation, um, Louverture is eventually betrayed and killed by a different French general, and um, one of his uh, sub-commanders takes over and, and sort of tries again, and the second time around uh, actually goes out and massacres, orders a massacre of a lot of the white colonists, a lot of the white, um, even native-born Haitian whites, right? So 
that really strikes fear in the heart of all these other slave owners around the world um, and ultimately results in an even stronger crackdown on Haiti. Although they don't necessarily kill all of the whites, they, they, they do kill a lot of people, but, um, but they let like non-French white people kind of stick around. Like there are some Polish people there, I think, um, and, and they're left alone. So what can we learn from Haiti about the situation in the rest of the Spanish Americas? A couple things to note are that after the death of Louverture and after some more warring revolts and invasion by Napoleon and things like this, Haiti found itself uh, for a time split into two. There was a kingdom to the north ruled by one person and a republic to the south ruled by uh, the president Pétion, who is the one who took in uh, Simon Bolivar when he was kind of on the run, right? And the, the Republic, at least while Bolivar was visiting, did not have too strong a centralized government. Uh, Pétion was uh, a proponent of democracy. He cared about being a republic. But sometime, I think, not too long after Bolivar's visit, he tries to change his role to be president for life of this republic. And that's a bit surprising. And one has to ask, what is it, what, what is this tendency in the Americas to so frequently turn to centralized autocratic governments? I'm left with that question. At the same time, you know, we see in the Angostura address, Bolivar has this strong conviction that the people of South America just don't have the constitution, the, the, the character to be able to take on a federalist system of government. And it, it's possible he was thinking here about the history he'd seen in Haiti, where there was a lot of factionalism, a lot of infighting, a lot of slowness to make decisions. And furthermore, really, the the first couple of republics in Haiti looked a lot like they were still promoting slavery, uh, just not nominally, right? So one of these attempts at forming a Venezuela, sorry, a, a Haitian nation allowed for basically plantations and required people to work as day laborers if they weren't in the army and things like this, and the, the one nod in this situation to abolitionism was to prohibit um, and completely ban whips from Haiti. And this doesn't really seem sufficient. It's explained by a couple of things, one of which is that Haiti's economy was very dependent upon agriculture and especially sugar plantations and sugar cultivation, among other things. And after all of these wars had been fought, Haiti was in a lot of debt. As I've mentioned already, there was a lot of infighting. It was just kind of an, an unstable place to be. And, and um, several years later, like in order to get the French government to recognize Haiti as an independent nation, one of these rulers basically agreed to pay off French plantation owners who had lost their stake in Haiti, and so they they agreed to a very large sum of money to pay back to the French. But in order to be able to pay it, they had to take off uh, take a massive loan from French banks, <laughs> and this basically bankrupted the country for a while and continues to affect its state today. So the countryside was ravaged by war. Um, they're now in massive debt, and there's a lot of infighting between different groups. All told, not a way you want to end up after a revolution. Unclear how much of this Bolivar could already see in 1816, 1817, 1819, right? Uh, but whatever the case might be, it's very clear that he was scared away by the high likelihood of these republics that were trying to be formed falling apart. And he did think that it was important to abolish slavery in order to get a stable government, because probably he was convinced by Pétion, like the insecurity of the 
social stratification involved in slavery isn't stable. If you're in a multicultural society, you don't want to be like the white plantation owners in the South in the United States who like lived in fear of a slave revolt. You don't want to try to start a new republic like the white Creoles of Haiti and end up just making everybody pissed off at you. So Haiti was very influential. Its constitution is still a very interesting read now. The thought of L'Ouverture was uh, quite important in its foundation. It wasn't naturally the only thinker, but it's very remarkable that a former slave managed to essentially change the shape of the world. One final effect that Haiti had was that the successful beating back of the forces of Napoleon when he tried to take Haiti back into his possession was that he kind of gave up the idea of trying to claim territories or keep territories in the Americas. So as a result of this, he ends up selling Louisiana to the United States. The Louisiana Purchase happens because of Haiti. So long story short, small country, enormous effects.